as you're coming on, if you want to, you can introduce yourself to everybody else and say uh, your, there's a slide about it, but um, your name, what role kids play in your life, whether you're a parent or a teacher or just somebody who, who likes them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, to kind of start there. And then uh, as soon as a few more people join us, we'll get going. I can start. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, I know some of your faces. I'm Amy Gray. I'm the education manager at the New Children's Museum. Um, so kids are a big part of my working life. They're also a big part of my home life. I have two boys, age three and 15 months, and they are a joy and a handful full and we play a lot. So I really enjoyed Megan's last presentation about play and I'm really looking forward to today's. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll go next. So um, my name is Linda and I'm in Toronto. I'm an outdoor education specialist um, for an outdoor play and learning program with the Toronto District School Board. Uh, I have no kids right now to play with <laughs> in my home. Um, so I'm just uh, trying to really learn more about how we reach kind of parents and families in this time and explain play and what it is we do. I like that we're a small group that we can actually do this. <laughs> it's good. Hi, I'm Ann McNulty. I'm the membership and merchandise manager at the New Children's Museum. Um, I have two adult children at my house, seniors that I am helping <laughs> take care of. <laughs> um, uh, but I do have a niece who I communicate with um, via Zoom and, and, and uh, uh, she's two and almost three actually. Um, and yeah, that's me. Uh, I'm Trish. I do playground design for the city of New York. And um, I don't have any kids to experiment with. <laughs> I know we really, those of us who don't have kids at home, I'm really missing kids. Like I see a kid walk yeah. by and I'm like, hi! Yeah. It's really kind of desperate yeah. to sit. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else want to introduce? I'm putting everybody on the spot. You don't have to, but if you want to. Hi. I'll say hi. Oh. Hi, Diana. Hello. I'm Diana. I'm here in San Diego, California, and I'm a mom to two daughters, ages 14 and 9, and I'm also an early childhood music and movement specialist, so I work with ages 0 to 5, but really ages 0 to 1,000 because music has no age limit, and I'm always interested in finding new ways to incorporate play and educate and empower our families to continue to play and learn with their children at home. And I'm Tomoko. I get to work with fabulous Megan, Lonnie, me, and Tana. Let's see who else is from the new children <laughs> online. But, um, you know, we're all sort of starved for that daily interaction. Um, at our museum. Some of us do have kids. I have a 12 year old, so he's an older child and um, I don't have as much juggling as Amy and Lonnie, but it's still, you know, quite a challenging time. And it's just been amazing to connect with everybody. So thank you for chiming in from Toronto and New York and San Diego and wherever you are, um, Los Angeles. It's, it's really wonderful to make new friends. Mm -hmm. John, I know you just joined us. We were, um, if you want to introduce yourself, you can introduce yourself. It's just, we're a smaller group today, so it's super fun for me, at least, because I also know most of you and I'm really excited to see you. <laughs> yes, Mimi. This is Mimi Bajor. Hey, oh my God, you're so big. Nathan, Sorry, I haven't seen you. Uh, 3.30. Uh, okay, Nathan and Benjamin. Um, I am the executive director of Rediscover Center, a kids maker space in LA, um, in the midst of transitioning to online programming. Um, I know a bunch of people here, actually. It's kind of cool to see. And um, Megan and I worked together 20 years ago or so. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Something like that. Um, and I'm a huge, huge fan of the New Children's Museum and all that you're doing. Oh, thanks. <laughs> 
Well, you know what? I, not everybody's had a chance to introduce themselves, but I'm going to move into the content, I think. Um, and basically, some of you know this, you've come to a few other ones, but we've been doing this every Tuesday. And it's really an opportunity for us to kind of do what we just did, just to see some other faces um, and chat about something that's important to that we have in common um, as part of the New Children's Museum. So basically, I'm going to talk for 15, 20 minutes. We're going to have time for discussion at the end. Um, just know that the talk is being recorded. Um, mute your microphone if you can. You don't really have to in this discussion. Feel free to unmute so you can just speak freely. Um, you can have your video on if you wish or if you decide that you don't want to. I don't want you to feel pressured to have your video on. Um, kids, pets, partners, anybody who wants to come into the frame is fine. Um, pretend like we're all hanging out. Um, if you have any private questions that you don't want to share with the overall group but you would like to have voiced, you can uh, send privately to Amy Gray. Amy, can you say hi? Or unmute for a second so everybody knows. Yeah. Well, actually, it's small enough. You can see. It's Amy. Hi. Yeah. Um, and the presentation is going to be accessible later this week on our website at thinkbycreate.org. That's where you can also find the other presentations we've been doing these Tuesdays. Um, if you have any other questions or things that you want to see, uh, email education at thinkplaycreate.org and we'll answer your questions. So what are some goals for today? Um, we're hoping to share some food for your brain about the science behind play. There is a lot of stuff going on about these are activities and you should do this, this, and this. And there's just a list of 10 things that you should do by Sunday. And we're not really doing that exactly. Um, just kind of sharing some things that we think about here that might be helpful to you. Um, I'm going to be talking about the play cycle specifically today, which is something that comes from play work, which I'll explain a little bit. Um, and our main goal is for group sharing and connecting with someone new. Um, you're not alone. So if you haven't done so already or introduced yourself um, by speaking, uh, in the chat box, write your name, your city, and again, like I said, what role do kids play in your life? Um, and then if you're an NCM member, uh, let us know that too. So first, about me. Um, a lot of you know me already, but um, that's me up in the right corner when I was about three. I was a very big three, but that's still a very big cat, right? It's very strange. Um, I'm an aunt to five amazing kids, and I also kind of feel like I'm an auntie to some of my friends' kids, um, who I love seeing every time I get to visit. Um, I'm the director of exhibitions at the New Children's Museum, and I've been here since 2013. I also study play and play work at the University of Gloucester, and I got my Did you all lose Megan too? Okay, Megan. Uh oh. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully, she's safe and nothing <laughs> happened to her in this moment. But she was, I, I will say, in the middle of saying, um, she studied play and play work um, at the University of Gloucester in um, the United Kingdom. I think she's probably just booting back up. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. And then something happens. Thanks, Mocha. I just texted her, so we'll have her back in a moment. Has it been to the New Children's Museum? Some. Some of you are very far away. Yeah, I realize that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I visited, um, this was two years ago when I was in San Diego. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Do you remember what was there? Uh, yes, the Wonder Sound. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of anything else that was, that really stood out there was a cool like almost like a topography of california with like cars <laughs> yeah. um yeah. yeah those two really stand out that's awesome yeah just send um lonnie amy uh info back to megan so if you don't mind leading a little conversation that'd be awesome
Everybody hear me? Um, yeah, the Linda, the, the exhibition that you mentioned is still up and popular, very popular. In fact, the cars that we use um, are so loved that we have to replace and fix them often. So really <laughs> sweet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a fun one. Yeah. And the wonder sound is also a piece that's still around. Um, I think initially we expected the work to be up for three to five years, but it's so popular and so amazing that it probably won't go away for a while. Um, we've had the opportunity through grants um, to bring Wes Sambrus, the artist of the, that work, back to the museum to refresh uh, the poetry that's all over the place and to give it some love. But what's really cool is that after Wes installed that piece for us, he's blown up in his own career and has been partnered with um, has partnered with different children's museums, um, including the Denver um, Children's Museum and I think Mass Mocha and others. Um, and is like enough. We're really proud of, of what he's been able to achieve and offer other children all over the country. It's been really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that piece definitely feels like one that I could have spent the entire day just there. Yeah. <laughs> I would have been able to do that several days in a row. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's over 30 hidden rooms. And um, it, it took two years to develop. But we, I think it was constructed within the matter of like three months or something insane. We had to get like, sh like pallets of lumber um, on a crane, like lifted up onto the upper level balcony from the street in order to get it all built. It was pretty insane. Um, and um, speaking of play, uh, because we were able to have a, um, a grant that supported that project, we were able to get um, Patty Sarniero is a local uh, professional evaluator. And one of the things she did as an experiment for us was attach GoPros to children to their bodies so we could follow their their um paths oh, wow. as they as they went into the spaces and we were like seeing things we never would have expected which was really cool like helping each other because there, there there's like translucent flooring right they think they can, they can fall through and you know some the older kids are like helping the little ones like it's okay it's okay come on so all those secret things you don't ever really see you know um it was really beautiful to witness and very dizzy, right? You can imagine it's like a home video, old school camcorder. <laughs> you just get sick after watching hours. Megan, are you back? I think her sound is... At least her, her PowerPoint's back, so she's slowly returning. You're on mute. <laughs> I'm just saying that I'm like angry at computers. Um, the irony is I downloaded Minecraft on my computer for a museum project and it's been shutting down because it's been overwhelmed <laughs> since then. So like, that's like such an adult problem, right? You know, you know when you download Minecraft on your computer and it starts shutting down? Okay, so, <laughs> no problem. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I think I was at, I hope you had a good ramping discussion for a minute. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I got my master's in play and play work. So that's what I studied. And uh, let's see, there we go. Um, but I also, at the museum, I work with artists to create the installations that you've seen, for those of you who have been to the museum. Um, you're really not supposed to do what my nieces are doing up here. That's not, that's a no-go, but it's after hours and they're my nieces and nephews, so it's cool. Um, I also do things like this. Um, <laughs> this is part of a camp over the summer and it was uh, sort of this free-ranging narrative that the kids were creating and at the end, they figured out that they had to make us all look ugly. And so they did this face paint and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. I like Diana, my colleague on the on my side is, is wearing a spider smashed <laughs> into her face, <laughs> which is pretty great. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I do. I also can't not play. It's really hard for me to not play. So that the comment before about missing having kids around this is us in the airport right before we went to the Association of Children's Museums conference and we happened to run into the other children's museum here in San Diego and there was this kid and we just immediately started doing weird stuff. Um, so today's topic 
is the play cycle. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Hopefully it's helpful. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about is this idea of survival is insufficient. So it comes from Star Trek, but it's also, if anybody's read Station Eleven, it's a good book. It creeps me out. It's great. Um, so I just finished reading that. So this idea that um, even in times of great stress, like if you live in a refugee camp, there's still space for play. So play is so important that these kids, uh, the Rohingya kids in um, Bangladesh at a refugee camp will continue to play. And so uh, recently it's been interesting, they've been trying to incorporate play schemes into FEMA style uh, responses. So they send out play workers actually. So there's a, a new um, project where play workers will go into these spaces and try to keep some sense of, of normalcy. So I keep mentioning play work. What is play work? So play work is a practice that comes out of the UK um, and Japan and Scandinavia to some extent. Um, it's where play workers are people who support all children and young people in the creation and maintenance of space in which they can play. And in play work, play is often defined as behavior that is freely chosen, personally directed, and intrinsically motivated. Play work is a really, how do I describe it? It's a question everything kind of practice. So there's a lot of debate over even this definition. Is it really freely chosen? If you go to an after school program and you're playing, but you don't choose to go to that after school program, somebody's enrolled in you in it, is it really freely chosen? So it gets super philosophical. But I do like this definition, which in kids' language is, it's what I do when everybody stops telling me what to do. So it's that moment where somebody's not saying, you have to do this right now. Or even if you're, somebody's telling you you have to do this, that you find a pocket that is your own, where you are really controlling what's happening in the play. So animals, obviously, also play. And um, that ended up being a theme in this. I didn't mean it to be a theme in this, but you know, cats, I got them. Um, and I like the definition from animal, there's research, a lot of research on animal play. There's more research on animal play than there is on human play, even though we are animals. And to look at play from that lens, they think of it as something that is as if. So first, you know, play isn't, it resembles something that's serious like hunting or escaping, but it's exaggerated in some way or awkward or otherwise altered. So there's something that we've changed in the way that we, that applies to humans too, um, are behaving that shows that this isn't an aggressive behavior necessarily. Um, it's enjoyable. It doesn't have any immediate survival purpose. It appears to be done for its own sake and it's voluntary and pleasurable. In play work, that's a whole big debate. Is it really pleasurable? You know, there's things that you're doing that's like the hard fun, like the Seymour Papert kind of stuff, where it's, this is actually, like, doesn't look like fun. Like a kid might be playing, and you're like, is that really, really fun? But it's fun for them because there's that challenge in it. And the last part is that there's no stress. So play occurs when an animal is not under stress and does not have something more pressing to do <laughs> for the caregivers among us that may hit a nerve um, when you're not under stress and don't have something more pressing to do. Most of the time, parents of young children have something more pressing to do if a child approaches them and wants to play. So how do you know it's play? Maybe it seems obvious, but it's not necessarily that obvious. Um, so here's an example. Um, Amy, Lonnie, and I usually uh, share a row of desks that overlooks the Children's Museum atrium. So we can see the welcome desk, we can see most of the exhibition spaces. And so we'll be sitting there, we joke around that sometimes when we hear a loud noise, we're like meerkats. So we'll be like, type, 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 type. And then we'll hear like a thump, thump, and we all go, <laughs> look <laughs> through the window to see what happened. And there's this moment of kind of like, okay, what was it, what was that, what was that sound? What was that, we have to, do we need to respond? And then we'll hear something like, Ah, I'm a tiger, Rawr! <laughs> and suddenly we can relax. It's actually not something that's a threat. And so we kind of, we can recognize when it's play or not play. Um, in that case, if we hear somebody pretending to be a tiger, we know that they're not really a tiger. We know that there's not really a tiger loose in the museum because most tigers don't talk. <laughs> and we know the, the laughing that they're probably enjoying it. 
and it doesn't seem like they're under stress. So it's not somebody who's running from an actual tiger and trying to pretend to be a tiger to scare off the tiger. That's a scenario that I just thought in my head that seems really scary. Um, <laughs> so if you're at home and you're seeing your child play, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, no matter how you slice it, seeing your child play is a good sign. This book, um, I recommend it. Welcome to your child's brain. You might have heard of it before. Um, it's got some helpful and very accessible information, not just about children playing, but all kinds of other things. There's, there's a foreword by Ellen Galinsky, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, but to go back to that sense of enjoyment. So there is a sense right now of here's what we should be doing. We should be really focusing on all of these classes that your child needs to be doing. We should be making sure that they're sitting at the computer for however long they're supposed to sit at the computer every day. But what we're really enjoying, <laughs> if you're thinking, Amy, what's the name of the game you're playing? The pirate game? Pirate rabbits. Yes, pi pirate rabbits, exactly. <laughs> the, um, the very important seminal pirate rabbits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's what we're really enjoying. So even in these moments of stress where we're all stuck at home, what we're enjoying is telling us what's important. And that's how we're wired. Um, the ability to enjoy an activity is a survival trait. And so you can't really forget that, that actually when you enjoy something, it's probably, there's probably something in it for you. Now, of course, there are things like Cheetos that simulate things that are good for you, but that aren't really good for you but play is something different. So we're wired to act to like activities that help ensure our survival. Um, but sometimes play can be stressful and you might hear play that seems a little intense. But wait, you said there's no play under stress. I was listening to what you said in that definition from Gordon Burkhart, eminent animal biologist. Um, there's good stress and there's bad stress. So you might be familiar with this, I am not a neuroscientist, um, but these are things that I've encountered in the literature. I'm um, talking about epinephrine, so it's adrenaline. It's released when there's a possible danger nearby. Um, in that meerkat example, it could be, you might experience some epinephrine at that point. You might think, okay, wait, what do we need to do? Um, and then it relaxes after that. Now there's also norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter. So as opposed to like a, a hormone in your body works slowly over time, a neurotransmitter is something that acts really quickly. Um, and it's related to brain plasticity. It's helping to create new synapses in the brain. But it also is, it's very related to that epinephrine response. It's a stress response. Um, it, however, it doesn't relate to cortisol, which is really damaging. So there's the good stress and the bad stress in play. And when there's good stress, there's often learning. So if you think about the things that, where you really learn something important, they probably weren't the easiest things that happened. So I mentioned before, Hard Fun by Seymour Papert, this idea of where it's really intense and you're really um, keyed into something that's happening, that might be your play and you're also learning at the same time. There is a difference between, I think, play and playful learning. So a lot of times we think of you know, uh, in a classroom where you're trying to learn about, you're trying to teach about a particular topic and you create a game so that the kids can learn that thing. That's playful learning, but it isn't always play. It might be play for those kids who are really into that, that type of play, but it may not be play for everybody. Um, but play is how our brain creates these new synapses that will allow us to continue to survive. So in other words, Play is important, but with this group, I don't need to actually stress that too much. Um, so what do play workers do? So play workers, again, are supporting children and creating and maintaining the spaces in which they can play. Um, and we're not spending a lot of time intervening. We're not setting up activities. Um, in order of priority, we're really observing, we're reflecting on what we're seeing, and then we're intervening if necessary. Now at this moment, being at home, we might think there's just one or the other. Either we have structured activities and we have the nine to five schedule that from our last chat we realized falls apart around four o'clock, three o'clock, um, or there's chaos. So if we don't have these structured activities, there's going to be just mass chaos. I think the kid has like a baguette. This is the weirdest picture. I don't even understand what's happening. Thanks Google Images. How many kids does she have? And are they different? Uh, anyway. Sorry, don't get distracted by the picture. So play work 
isn't really we're structuring activities and we're leading activities and it's not do whatever you want. Um, I have a personal pet peeve when people mention the book Lord of the Flies in relation to children's play because Lord of the Flies is really an allegory about how humans react, adult humans react to each other. Um, typically when kids are left to their own devices, they do some really beautiful things. Um, so again, in order of priority, it's observe, reflect, and then intervene if necessary. I've been watching those design shows on Netflix and one of them, um, the interior designer says, I tell my staff, you have two eyes, two ears, one mouth, and use them in that proportion. And it's kind of true. So you're really looking and listening more than you're trying to direct. So today's tool, the play cycle. Um, this is something that we use in training the new play workers who come to the Children's Museum. So I should have said that um, for the last uh, five years, I've been training people who work in exhibitions in the uh, practice of play work. And this is one of the first things that I share with them to help them kind of understand what's happening in children's play. So the play cycle comes from two therapeutic play workers is what they called themselves, Gordon Sturrock and Perry Else. And it's a really intuitive, easy way of understanding how we play. So I'm gonna go through each individually, but to give you a broad overview, there starts with the metalude or the play drive. So you're already in a playful state. A play cue comes your way, someone returns it, it sets up a frame of how you're going to behave, and that behavior might shift and change incrementally, it's called play flow, until something happens to end it, and we call that annihilation. So that's the broad overview. Right? Go into, I can never spell annihilation. Every single time I, I write it, I have to, and I write it all the time because I talk about the play cycle with play workers all the time. Anyway, annihilation. So first of all, this metalude or play drive, so this is where kids live most of the time. They're already looking for what might be possible in this space. Um, if you think about kids in the airport, most people don't play in airports, but kids play in airports and they're looking for that thing that, they're looking for play cues, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so in thinking about our own spaces, does the space create a playful mood? Um, and then you personally, if you're, you're thinking about playing, am I basically free of major bad stress? Do I feel like, um, in the animal example, that do I feel free of predation? That there isn't something that's going to swoop in and carry me off? So the metaloom is where you start. Um, one thing about um, our museum, we think a lot about the opening space as you cross this architectural bridge that leads you into the New Children's Museum. And that's where the metaloom, I think, starts. So you're trying to create you know, in curating spaces, trying to think about artwork that can be seen by kids in all different spaces. So they're already thinking, where am I? What is this place? What more might be done? So play cue is something that could come from a person or it could come from an object. So it might be that you're playing, I have some handy dandy objects. Let's say you have a ball of clay and you're playing with the clay and you realize that if you jam your thumb into it, it will make a big pool. And you start to realize, so the play, your play cue is to the object and the play um, object is returning it by whatever it does. Um, sometimes it's a play cue could be the wind. You're in the backyard and you start to notice that things are moving, the, the grass is moving in a certain way. You wonder, what if I took this piece of string and I held it up in the air? Um, the play cue with people is often Let's say, um, oh, actually, first with the dogs, um, the play bow. Does anybody have a dog? I know you guys are all mostly muted, but dogs, no? No dogs, huh? No. Um, but you've probably seen this kind of behavior before where the dog goes down on its forelegs, and that's a signal to other dogs that it is going to be playful, that it's not going to, if it like goes for the other dog's neck, it's not trying to kill the other dog, it's trying to play with the other dog. So that's a play cue. It's like, I wanna play or wagging your tail. Now for humans, let's say you're giving your kids a bath and suddenly they take a bunch of fluff and they blow it in your face. Now, if you're just trying to get the bath done and you're tired and you need to move on to the next thing, 
you might be like, don't, okay, don't, don't put that in mommy's face. Mom, mommy doesn't like that right now. Mommy doesn't like that. Sorry, that's my example. I'm not a caregiver, but as I'm a man, I'm looking at you, Amy. Um, now, uh, you might instead do a play return, which is, and some of you have probably done this before, the bubbles get blown in your face and you playfully blow them back or you take it and you smush it into their hair. Um, it's a sign that you've accepted the invitation. So one play cue that I often give as an example is if I'm talking to a group of adults at the museum and there's toddlers with them, sometimes I just start moving my feet slightly, like a little bit side to side, because that's what they can see. And then I'll notice that they start to move their feet a little bit, and that's their play return. And now we've set up this play frame. Nobody knows around us is, knows it is happening, but it's this little thing that we've set up. It's like a little special sweet thing. Um, yes, yeah, so blowing, <laughs> blowing it back. Thanks, I stock by Getty Images, a sponsor of True Tuesdays. Um, play frame again sets up the rules. So this often happens in, um, let's say, a dramatic play example. Um, if somebody says, "Okay, you come into the room," and a kid says, um, "I'm making cookies," it's a, as if behavior. She's not actually making cookies. Um, do you want to try one? So play cue, you say, mmm, that's delicious. Play return. And then she says, oh, but we have to really get busy. We have so many cookies to make before the end of the day. So now the play frame is we have to work quickly to make these cookies. And that's also where the stress can come in because it can be really stressful moments. Like sometimes when I'm playing with kids, I'm like, oh my God, how are we going to make all these cookies? <laughs> and I have this, and maybe I'm just so into it, but I'm like, okay, wait, we, and how are we going to get boxes for them? And how are we going to do that? You know, so um, that becomes a play frame. There's the example. I'm making cookies. Um, play flow is where it gets really beautiful because things can change really quickly from instead of cookies, they're flying saucers. Instead of flying saucers, they are hockey pucks. Instead of, you know, it keeps going and going and going. And it can actually go forever. Um, I've been in a play frame, play flow with a six-year-old friend of mine for weeks now. And every time we pick up the phone to do FaceTime, we pick up right where we left off. Um, but it is, there's, you've built up that trust through all the, the play cue. I give you a play cue, you've returned it. It's a conversation that's happening. But then there's adulteration, which is almost as funny as annihilation. So adulteration is a word that Sturrock and Els use to talk about when we try to push our adult agenda on the kid. And it's so common. I'm sure that everybody has an example of when they've done this. Um, so for example, if we're playing with clay, sometimes you can ask, okay, what do you think? Ooh, I wonder, it's, it's, it's really smushy. Why do you think it's smushy? That's not necessarily adulteration. If I suddenly start saying, kids really interested in texture and I start saying, what color is this? We practiced it last week. What color is this? And suddenly you might even see the kids body language shift because now they're in a classroom environment that you've created. You've actually pushed the play frame in a completely different direction. Um, there's also the aspect where we're trying to um, deal with unplayed out material. So that's things that we really love to do either as adults or as kids and we try to to push that on kids. I'm super guilty of this. Um, remember this picture of me with a cat? I kind of want to play cats all of the time. <laughs> and so sometimes I'll be playing with a kid and I'm not completely sure what the play frame is and I start meowing and I realize it was, it's like totally the wrong thing but then you've gone too far down that road and the kid's trying to respond because they, they want to please you, you know? They want it like, oh, the grown up wants to meow. That's not what I wanted to do but I guess we're cats now. <laughs> and the thing to remember in all of this is that this is kind of an inside joke, but um, imagine this in like a super Boston accent. You know, you're not the boss right now, Nancy. Like, hear that in your head whenever you're playing with kids <laughs> because you're not the boss. It really, like, being a play worker, it's, that's one of the hardest things to explain is that you're really, you're not always playing. Um, sometimes there's moments where I get into play and I almost have to stop myself a little bit because the more I get into play, the more I'm going to, there's a ch chance of me adulterating the play. So that is a whirlwind tour through the play cycle. Um, I want to see people's faces again. 
Um, I'm going to introduce some topics. Unless, is anything happening in the chat that you want to bring up? Or you guys can unmute too if you just want to talk. Let me see your faces. There we go. Uh, Megan, someone asked for you to share again, what is annihilation in terms of play? Oh my God, I totally forgot about annihilation. You guys are good friends. Thank you. That's, <laughs> that's terrible. Annihilation. Oh, geez. Okay. So totally didn't even make a slide. Um, annihilation is when the play cycle, the play flow ends. And so sometimes, um, an example I often give for the clay patio at the New Children's Museum is where a um, kid will be making something, since I happen to be holding clay, and has been working at this thing really diligently. And then they hear it's time to go. We have five more minutes. And then suddenly they smash it at the end. And you don't really understand why they would they worked so hard on this thing, but they smashed it. Um, the annihilation was really on the part of the adult because sometimes we have to go and do other things. We can't stay there forever, but that kid is taking some control over them and making it part of their own narrative. So I meant for this to happen. Um, annihilation is often adult related because kids don't control all of their time so that they're just able to hang out forever. Now it might be different. Annihilation might be very different at, you know, when you have all the time now, you're hanging out at home. Um, sometimes it happens because you're too tired and you've been playing for a long time and you kind of, you just like want to take a break, but you don't socially know how to do that with another kid. So often there'll be, you start to find conflict and so, so sometimes this ends in tears. Sometimes annihilation will end with somebody punching somebody else, um, particularly with siblings, because often with siblings, it's play for one of them, but it's not play for another. <laughs> I was guilty of that as an older sibling. I would say, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, and they kind of go along with it. Like I was adulterating play since like 1987, guys. I'm like super expert at this. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But yeah, so, so that's, that's what annihilation is. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Because I actually have like a question about it later. It'd be really awkward if you're like, they're like, no, what's that? I don't know what that is. Um, other questions? Um, we have some other great questions. Uh, someone was asking basically how to remain active and engaged as a noticer when it's been happening for a long time. So when there's nothing new to notice, mm -hmm. how do you continue? Wow. So like... The child's playing the same thing over and over. I will read you specifically what the question was. How do you remain an active and engaged noticer the thousandth time someone is figuring out how to get the fifth box on the stack when there's nothing new to notice? Right, right, right. And you're like, just put it up there. Come on. Yeah. Um, well, I would step away at that point hmm. if that's possible, you know? Um, I think what's hard, and this is something I wanted, oh, there's annihilation. <laughs> Guys, there's a slide, showed up, here it is. Um, so this is one of the things I think that, that, that's related to this is, you know, how do you extend your child's play when you don't have the capacity to return their play? Because that's what I'm kind of hearing that question a little bit, which is um, like, they keep doing the same thing. And it's like hearing the same song or wanting to read the same book over and over again. And you're like, I can't read that book again. Um, and so the question is like, when do you step back? When are you too engaged? And it's also different for only children versus children with other siblings or other, other kids around um, because they can find their own way in a different way. For kids who are, where it's just adults and one kid in the house, they're really looking at you for um, play return probably a lot of the time. Does that resonate with people who have little kids in the house? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that, that was my question. I can yeah. elaborate. Um, one of the things that we really look for in our facilitators is getting excited because they are participating in the play. Mm -hmm. But if every kid who comes in kind of starts with the same engagement and goes in three or four familiar paths, it's hard to still feel like I'm excited to play this again with yeah. this person. Mm -hmm. with the new person, but it's totally new to them. It's just mm -hmm. boring to us mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. a couple of years. How Is do you it stay the same intro activity each time or the just kids just happen to do the same thing over and over? I mean, it's a set of materials. So there's, I mean, once you get into it after half an hour, you'll find some, 
interesting things that maybe we haven't done before, or we're starting to know people individually, but as a getting to know you, there are only yeah, a couple pathways that people yeah. start with you. You're like in play purgatory as an adult? And the adult is in play purgatory for a little while. <laughs> and it's an important yeah. time because it's the first moments that we're engaging with someone. And they're yeah. starting to, to, to really learn what can be possible in this space, what's accepted by the adults in the space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's what's interesting, right? Is because it's like, you can just like the micro differences, you know, like, so that every kid stacks a block in a, maybe a slightly different way. I think like stepping back to and learning like how close does this kid want you to be or how far away, you know, and then thinking about how do they um, provide play cues to others, I think is interesting because um, I'm assuming there's other kids in the space at the same time. It's not just like one kid, you know, so starting to notice, okay, this kid, um, oh, here's a perfect example. Um, so a friend of mine was talking about how there was a kid who kept coming onto their adventure playground, so the loose parts playground, um, outdoors in this case, and um, kept going up to other kids and trying to get them to play with them, and nobody was returning her play cues. And she was just kind of, it was just, just different. Um, and they actually saw her play cues as a little bit aggressive, so the play worker steps back and realizes a moment where maybe she's going to return the play cue. So make sure that the kid gives her the play cue and she can return the play cue. Um, and one of the things like she wanted us, like, do you like swings? She asked. And so they end up making a swing over on the side. And then the swing became this place where she could go and be like careful and be by herself. And the other kids, the swing was the play cue. So kids came to her and wanted to play with her because she created this thing. So it's not completely answering your question, John, but like thinking about when you're trying to understand how kids are relating to each other, it's, it's why I like the play cycle, because if you think about it in terms of play returns and play cues, it gives you a language to talk about it. Like the blocks are giving a return to that child, but and then it's like, well, do we need to take a step back? Does there need to be a more diverse materials, right? If we're seeing the same kind of behavior, or is it the child trying to acclimate to the the culture of the place, this is what we do with these blocks, or does the play worker need to do something different with the blocks, you know, without adulterating it? Does that make sense? Sorry, I'm so like, like play cycle is so in my head. I know it's new to many of you, but hopefully that makes sense. I was gonna suggest something kind of similar, um, if I could piggyback on that. Please do. Yeah. We used to do, in the organization I was working with, we used to do lots of um, pop-up adventure playgrounds. And so it was kind of a similar kit of loose parts we were bringing all the time and we'd see a lot of the same play happening. Um, and there was that sense of like, we don't really know these kids because we're popping up in a new area and this is our first experience with it. And they're kind of getting to know the space and what they can and can't do. And they're kind of figuring all that out. And so a lot of the time I wouldn't, I would play with the materials in a wacky, unusual way but I wouldn't, I wouldn't explain what I was doing to the kids. I was kind of just doing parallel play to them. And sometimes they were really excited by that. And they took what I had and would build it onto what they were doing. Sometimes they looked at me like I was nuts, but it was just kind of my way of saying like, anything's open here. And you know, you don't have to stack those blocks. You can smash those blocks. You can do whatever with it. So it, it felt like, um, like a subtle nudge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's super helpful. Well, because you're helping to, a lot of times you're walking into a pre-existing frame. So kids who are, you're walking onto a playground that you've never been onto, you don't know what's happening. So there's a lot of adjusting to the existing frames. You're not often doing this from scratch. So you're helping to kind of like skew the frame a little bit to allow for other behavior. Like that's, that's the main thing about being a play worker. You realize just how much of an impact your small actions have on the kids around you because they are trained to like be constantly in tune with what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do here? You know, you know, most neurotypical kids are, are, are constantly looking for those kinds of cues from around them. So often stepping back is the most important thing. Now that's really hard to do when you have a kid who's constantly coming up to you in your house saying, how about this? How about this? How about this? Right? <laughs> so that's different. Megan, we have a couple of other questions that have come up. Um, first one I can definitely relate to, just thinking more about what you were 
speaking about with adulteration and you know as an educator like wearing the many hats that we all probably do mm -hmm. and um do you have other than just like being compassionate with ourselves and forgiving when we are doing that do you have um mm -hmm. tips or suggestions for for how we can um shift away or reframe mm -hmm. um those impulses yes it's so hard um, because that's the, the part of play work that's actually like the, the self-help part because <laughs> you really um, like one of the things that I often recommend and some of you in this group have done is um, play mapping and thinking about a space that you really enjoyed spending time in when you were a kid under 12, let's say. Um, because then you start to realize like if you had that moment of what you would do when nobody else was telling you what to do you start to realize some things about yourself that are still very much there. Um, and then you can start to recognize when you start to go into those directions. Like before I studied play work, I wouldn't have known necessarily. <laughs> okay, there's some people in this room that have known me for 20 years, so you would obviously know this, but that I like to wear costumes <laughs> and I like to dress up. And I, I knew that about myself, but I didn't think about it in the context of working with kids that I would be pushing them towards a a play that is, that is mine and so that was something where I had to really step back because I'd be like we could wear this funny hat and we could do this and look to, you know and it's just like stop <laughs> so um that that's one of my main recommendations is just to kind of think about what you're bringing into it and then also the unplayed out material it's like stuff that like you didn't get to do um for I was once doing a project in Boston a long time ago where we were asking people who lived in a particular community um, what they wanted to do. And all the stuff that kept coming up from the adults was unplayed out material. It was stuff that they really wanted to do that they didn't get to do as kids. But when you talk to the kids, it wasn't really what they wanted to do because times were different and, you know, kids wanted to do different things. So that's, that's a really difficult thing to try to recognize. Um, that'd be kind of a fun session later on to talk about play mapping and identifying what your, your things are. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Um, the adulteration part also about um, like ask yourself, why am I doing this, right? So sometimes if you're trying to guide the child towards learning numbers or letters or things like that, um, think about, am I doing this because I want to be seen as a good teacher or a good parent? Um, is it about my ego a little bit? Or is it really that I know this kid is really excited about learning letters and has every time we bring up a new letter that kid gets really excited is it about me or is it about the kid i think i'm i'm guilty of both or both both happen with me, me too. So definitely really yeah me too um we have another question megan um can you negotiate how the playtime can pause or end so you can solicit feedback from a young child especially if they have a limited concept of what five more minutes means. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so I, I elicit feedback. I don't, I don't like sort of like in what context somebody wants to share in the comments they can want to elaborate. Five more minutes is hard because like what is five minutes, especially in the time that you're like, I don't even know what day it is. We're like the trash, somebody else's trash came down. So I was like, I don't know, is it Wednesday? Oh God, we forgot to take the trash out, but it was our neighbors. So like, what is time? See, play workers, philosophical. It gets super philosophical. Um, they elaborate, um, include your child in how you decide when to end play. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so I think it's like a, there's another thing that we use in play work called risk benefit assessment, where we're really trying to measure um, what's the benefit of something that we might want to try, what are the possible risks, if there's any hazards like, you know, death, you don't do it. But if it's a risk that you're willing to take. So I, I kind of in those moments, and I'm not a parent, so I, I don't want to be like Mary Poppins. Oh, all you got to do is put a spoonful of sugar and a bit of spray. Um, that's a really terrible Mary Poppins impression, guys. Don't ever do that. Um, but to say, what's the worst thing could happen if, if a play continued right now? Like, do we really need to go, you know? And like, in play work, we're usually just pretty honest. Like, the Adventure Playground is closing. 
that's why you have to go. <laughs> you know, we can't be here until like there, there's going to be nobody here. I have to go home. Or like even like I have at the museum. Sometimes my workers will be like, I have to go home and cook dinner. Do you need to cook dinner, <laughs> right? Um, but I guess I'm I'm still like wrapped up in this time, like this moment. I would have had a different answer probably a month ago. You know, um, my answer a month ago, two months ago would probably be more like, yeah, absolutely involve them in the, like, how do we want to count the time or how do we want to, you know, what's the best way to do this? Do you want to, like, which alarm do you want? You know, um, what, what's the, the best thing? Should I make a funny sound? Like when I go, rah, 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 that means that it's time to go. So that's sort of playful. There's also, this is a really tricky thing because it so turns into adulteration really quickly, but trying to end the play within the frame, if that makes sense. So some, sometimes it works like you're playing a restaurant. Restaurants closing, God, all my references are like outdated now. We don't have restaurants anymore. Um, <laughs> but you know, like the restaurant's closing, but it's gonna be open tomorrow. Can we open it up tomorrow at, at when we wake up? Can the restaurant open up again? And that, I found that to work. Um, but then as long as they know that, as long as they know that you know that they know that it's part of the play. If they think that, the kids think that you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes, then it's, it's much more painful and someone's gonna trash that restaurant, I'm telling you. Other questions? We don't have any more in the chat right now. Um, I was going to offer to Megan and I brought this up in other conversations that um, when we do play pirate rabbits, one of the ways we sort of close it out every time that's natural and, and it's typically like the same amount of time, but is we finish a mission. So mm -hmm. right. we're, we're on the hunt for something. What is it this time? Mm -hmm. My son who's three leads the way with all of that, but he also decides when we found what it is we're looking for. And most of the time it's imaginary. So, you know, and, and that sort of concludes the game and that's a nice natural pause that comes up mm -hmm. for us. I love that. I also love that you're looking for things that are imaginary. <laughs> They're very hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but that, but that opens things up so much because again, we have such power as adults. And so um, if we say you need to go find this thing, they're going to try to find exactly that thing. But if that thing could be anything, mm -hmm. then you're opening yourself up to be really surprised. And then it, it is engaging you. I think that's the stuff that keeps it exciting. Because at the spy game, we play a spy game at the New Children's Museum, and it gets really boring for staff when they are doing something else. Let's say they're working at the desk and a kid comes up and does a secret sign. And they're like, uh, go count how many this, uh, blah, blah. you know, the kid knows that you're doing something else and it's not necessarily the right thing for you, but that's not fun. When you give a, a, a go find out, there's a something that we did, don't know that exists over in this space. Can you see if you can find it? And then they come back and usually you learn something about a space that's very different than what you expected. So those are my, my favorite things. That's, that's why I like, you know, play work is just, it's, it's hard working without a script. You know, for years and years, I worked with curriculum, you know, like, John, you and I developed curriculum, didn't we? Like, you know, it's like, you, you have, like, I had things where I was supposed to say a certain thing at a certain time. We'd be like, now I wonder, will it sink or will it float? <laughs> you know? And at a certain point, you were like, it's gonna sink, goddamn, and I know it. You know, <laughs> and the things that are more exciting and have given me this like fresh, you know, perspective on kids is I can learn as much from them as they can, you know, from me. Um, and it comes from just a deep respect for their capacities and 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 an appreciation, right? Um, sorry, I'm all philosophical again, but. I mean, I know that there's other, you know, play workers in the room, you know, people who, or at least if you didn't know you were a play worker, you probably do now, now, um, if this, this resonates. Other things that you want to share, I mean, like, Linda, do you use the play cycle in your work? Sorry, I put you on the spot. Uh, um, 
We used to a little bit. I found we were primarily in schools and so we're, we're working primarily with teachers who are a really funny bunch. Sometimes you get a teacher who um, is super playful and is just kind of like, oh, this has been me all along. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times we get um, that like playful learning, like that's used a lot in our curriculum. And so we have people who say, oh yes, I know this. I've done play inquiries in my science lessons. And so it's, it's one of these funny things that we, um, we spend a lot of time talking about play and kind of breaking it down. Um, but I have to say we use, like for us, we use a lot of the um, like play types mm -hmm. and just like really basic exercises for um, observing play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I found sometimes they got a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit scared by the play cycle that it was like, oh, this, this very scientific thing and there's an order to it. And so sometimes that put people yeah, off. Interesting. Because it's not ordered. It's all like, it's like pretending like you're like putting into a nice, but it's all happening at the same time. It's like overlapping. There's one play cue happening in a play return. There's this play frame and there's overlapping play frames. That, that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I found it was a lot easier to um, have people start from observing play and like kind of telling us what were some of their observations and then us breaking down from that either, you know, some play types you might've seen or that, that idea of a play cycle happening so that they kind of experienced it first and felt like, oh, I knew this all along. Maybe I just didn't know the names for it or I didn't right. know how this worked. Right. Right. Yeah. We're kind of like focusing on what's your intu intuition, right? Like before you start to kind of put it onto this. Yeah, exactly. I think we're about at time. So I wanted to close unless um, there's anything else, Amy, that you wanted to put out there? No, I think, I think we've, responded to everyone's questions in the chat. Yeah. So um, this presentation will be available on our website so you can go back and think that we should find a way to make these resources easily accessible so maybe we can post it on our website. Um, there's um, also, uh, I know it happened guys, my old presentation didn't upload when I went back up. It was, it was an old one so that's why it's not showing up. Um, there is a great post about the play cycle from um, Scrap Store UK, which um, we can send out. Do you guys, Lonnie and Amy, do you have that link? Were you able to post it into the chat? I will post it. Cool. So that goes into it more in depth and actually has um, some questions I think would be really helpful to those of you who work with kids in a professional capacity too. Um, next Tuesday, Amy Gray takes the stage with Debbie Zeichner, who is a licensed clinical social worker and parent coach. Um, and the topic is, no, I won't. No, I won't. No, I won't. Now I have to work on that. How, how would you say that? No, I won't. No, no I won't. Oh, toddler talks. What, what's wrong with me and my impressions? I don't even know. <laughs> um, toddler defiance and positive discipline. So join us again and spread the word to anybody who you think might be interested in that talk. Um, I'm looking forward to it myself. <laughs>